Good afternoon, Mr. President of the Societies of School of Planning and ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, tremendously pleased and honored to be here in, in Dublin, not just because I, I like to come to Dublin, uh, this is my second time here, uh, but also to be invited to talk to this very distinguished audience of uh, academics in urban planning. And I think this is an opportunity for me to raise some of of the reflections about this concept, which I've been thinking around for many years. And hopefully during this week, we could have a very lively uh, discussion. Because I, I think, I sincerely think there is uh, an important message within, within this concept of resilience and sustainability, uh, <clears throat> which we need to take on board and operationalize. Uh, what we shouldn't do is conflate them to the two concepts and, and use one um, to mean the other. So, the, the theme of the whole conference on, on planning for resilient cities and regions, I'm going to address all of those key words uh, in my presentation in, in the next uh, 35, 40 minutes and so, or so. And um, I'm going to start with um, actually telling a bit about uh, the history of, of resilience. Uh, where, where are the roots and how can we Sort of, I think that would help us interpret the concept better when we take that concept into a different context. What are the limitations, the constraints we need to be aware of? I'm going to talk about resilience and scale. I think this is a key issue uh, which have to be addressed. And I think it's within the theme of the conference. You talk about resilience of cities and regions. And I'm also going to talk about resilience and planning. And a little bit of perspectives on where I think there are um, challenges, but also quite a lot of, of exciting opportunities. So I think resilience is not a panacea that's going to help us deal with a very complex world. What I do think it could do is actually help us focus and, and help us address new questions about our systems, giving a new perspective. And we need those new perspectives because we're living in the Indian term Anthropocene, a changing world. What you see here, those yellow dots are airplanes uh, traveling around the globe. This would, is an animation of the, a 24-hour period of um, airborne transportation in the world. And you see now Heathrow woke up and we have, Europe looks like an ant nest. There is just a tremendous connectivity on the planet within uh, continents and between continents, which is sort of silent out there. We don't really confront that in our daily thinking. But we need to confront that because it means so much when it comes to the flow of material, energy, ideas, <clears throat> but also things that, that we are quite vulnerable when it comes to uh, pandemics, pathogens, all sorts of things that also are um, linked to this tremendous connectivity. And I think this changing world with this huge global complexity uh, then really uh, necessitate that we start, take a step back, try to get some new perspectives, ask some new questions about uh, the system we are dealing with uh, to come up with new ideas and new solutions. This is the title page of uh, the UN <coughs> report from the high-level panel to the Rio Plus 20 meeting, Resilient People, uh, Resilient planet, planet, a Future Worth Choosing. And we can start thinking of, suddenly now the, the word resilience is uh, on this. In, in uh, Rio 1992, the first Rio meeting, uh, it was all about sustainability. The same thing in Johannesburg. Um, so what has happened? Why is um, resilience now becoming uh, so important? Yeah. <clears throat> the UN Secretary General uh, even stated, uh, building resilience thinking into policy and practice will be a major task for all of the world's citizens throughout the new century. So I think we can start here and, and think about what, what is actually the difference between uh, resilience and sustainability. Seeing this evolution within the UN system where in the Rio 92 it's all about sustainability and Rio plus 20 last year it's, it was all about resilience. Are these concepts then meaning more or less the same? <clears throat> or would that serve us very well if, if they are? 
I would argue that we, sh we should actually work really hard to, to keep these concepts different and actually <clears throat> view them as linked but different. So one way of viewing sustainability is that this is a way of managing resources in a way that guarantees welfare and promotes equity in, in current and future generations. So this builds on the Brundtland report. While resilience, the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure and feedbacks. And I would argue that these are different, that <clears throat> what sustainability is, is the normative goal. This is something we, we could set up as a society. This is the goal where we want to be with, with, a, <clears throat> with high levels of equity and distribution of resources um, and uh, uh, that are guaranteed to be uh, generated over long time periods. So that's normative. Uh, but I would argue that resilience is more of the non-normative process involved in reaching that normative goal. And that we should actually also be aware of that we could leave it open that resilience, <clears throat> we could actually be in a situation where we want to break down resilience. Where resilience is not desirable. We want a transformation, but <clears throat> we have a For example, poverty sometimes could be a very resilient, undesirable state of a system. And we want to know how, how could we actually, in, a more, in the most efficient way, uh, break down poverty that resilient type of poverty and <clears throat> induce a transformation. So I think this is one way of viewing the two, two concepts, seeing that they're related and that the one could be useful for the other. I don't think it's useful if we use them just interchangeably. That <clears throat> and we can't talk about resilience without addressing um, <clears throat> the great thinker, uh, Mr. Uh, C.S. Buzz Holling himself, um, that published, <clears throat> published numerous papers over the years, but one, one I think, um, very important one, uh, came out already in 1973, where he argued that <clears throat> there are so many more important aspects to the resilience concept than the ones that came out of engineering literature. And he actually introduced the, the way of complex systems thinking, and uh, viewing um, our world, our planet, as an interconnected uh, social ecological system. And so that was one, one thing that really brought um, new attention to the concept. The second was uh, the concept of non-linearity non and that the way that we have been viewing the world as linear <clears throat> for uh, centuries is simply wrong. In, in most, for most systems, um, we can't describe them with linear models. We have to use nonlinear models, and that would have enormous consequences for the way how we design management uh, of these systems and how we design uh, society's response uh, to change. So these are two important <coughs> lines of ideas that were introduced already in 1973 on the coupled interconnected social ecological systems and the notion of nonlinearity. Uh, this has lately been, <clears throat> and if you want to just pick one publication on resilience, I would recommend this Resilience Thinking by Salt and Walker that came, I think, 2007, uh, published by Island Press. Uh, you can find numerous papers uh, by Carl Folke, uh, Stephen Carpenter, um, Brian Walker and others at the uh, Resilience Alliance uh, webpage, resalliance.org. That will give you all of that <clears throat> sort of background, the history and foundation. Uh, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, of, of in linearity and nonlinearity, because I think it's important. And I think here is where, where there is some <clears throat> challenges and opportunities within urban planning to take this on board. And, understand what it's actually mean to abandon the view of a linear world. So this is the classical way we've been viewing the world. We have, uh, we have changing conditions and we have a changing in state, but it's all linear and it's perfectly reversible. Uh, now we, we can fairly say this is a wrong model of the world. Uh, we have a much more complex world with nonlinear responses. So we could have, <clears throat> 
thresholds and regime shifts, so conditions could change and then um, uh, the state of the system change uh, through a threshold. In this case, it is potentially reversible if we have um, <clears throat> the knowledge and the investment, we could reverse the system and avoid uh, sort of a permanent change. But we should also be aware of that in some systems, this <clears throat> they could be in practice irreversible if they go through a threshold and regime shift. And this is called, in, in, <clears throat> in the modeling language, hysteresis. And this is something um, that we need to be aware of that it could be part of, of systems that you move, you move along the axis, uh, reach your threshold, uh, the system flips into another uh, type of conditions, but to move from here to there, uh, you need to move very, very, very far on this axis, which could, for example, mean that you have to invest a lot of money in, in restoring, removing, uh, what, whatever the system you are describing. But <clears throat> this, there's been uh, more and more cases of this in the literature. Uh, and this is something where, where there's a sort of a warning flag that uh, these are quite tricky systems to deal with. Once you've gone, gone over a threshold, it's very difficult to get back. One such system, um, large scale one, <coughs> which has been practically uh, irreversible, uh, this shows um, um, what happened 5,000 years ago when a slow variable, there was a changing radiation from the, from the sun going on over millennia, and suddenly that resulted in a threshold where <clears throat> over a very short time period, the vegetation on the Sahara collapsed. This, is, this was a major regime shift going on, and, and we still live with that regime shift of, of a tree-less and vegetation-less uh, Sahara. Uh, this is another large-scale, non-linear <coughs> collapse, which hasn't uh, come back. This is the, uh, <coughs> showing the, the fish catch of cod in, in outside the coast of Canada in, in ground banks and, and other fishing areas. And as you see, um, there was a huge uh, peak in, in fish catch in, in the late 1970s and then uh, a tremendous decline and a collapse. The collapse was around the early 1990s and there's now been a ban on fishing for <clears throat> 25 years and nothing has happened. The fish is not coming back. So this is something we need to be concerned about and, and, <clears throat> and I think we also understand non-linearities uh, much better if we also <clears throat> understand and get these complex ecosystems visualized. So what you see here is actually the food web, the network of connections among organisms in the North Atlantic. Previously, we had just a very <clears throat> fragmented picture. Now, with modern research, we, we have a full picture of the connect how species are connected to each other, and in the end, how they also are connected to humans. And here is the cod inside that system. And I think we all can understand that <clears throat> it's incredibly difficult to manage or manipulate this system and believe that it will behave in a linear way, given all these complexity and all these connections. So here, as humans, we need to be humble and start to think, approach management of fisheries in a, in a very different way than we have done so far. And I think this <clears throat> then bears into um, what all of you are doing in, in your daily life when it comes to understanding and, and managing resources, that nonlinearity would bring in new questions, new approaches, <clears throat> new ways of looking at things, and, and also becoming more humble, that the world is very complex, and it's not linear, and it's very difficult to predict. And if you try to predict, you, <clears throat> you are very likely to be wrong. So, what, what is the explanation of what happened in, in the North Atlantic? So, here is the, here's the model. Um, before, when, when there were lots of cod, they were eating small fish, crab, and shrimp. And 
When these populations were small, we had many large-bodied plankton, and they would in turn eat a lot of phytoplankton, and then we had lots of nitrate <clears throat> in the water. When we were fishing the cod, they disappeared. We got lots of small fish, crab, and shrimp. They were then eating uh, the zooplankton, and as a consequence, we got more phytoplankton, and they were then <clears throat> de <clears throat> depleting the nitrate in the water. And this seems to be a rather irreversible flip of the system. So you have flipped from this to this, and, and it's very difficult to get back or understand how do we get back. Uh, because there is the desire to get back to have a much higher fish production in the system. And just another example of these regime shifts and, and how difficult they are to deal with. This is <clears throat> work done on coral reefs around the world and how coral reefs actually can move from one stability domain, this is a very healthy reef, to a stressed one, to one that is dominated by seaweeds. And <clears throat> usually increasing of the fishing pressure is one factor that would trigger that and, and also nutrient. So given that if if we find ourselves up here, and this is an undesirable state of the system, and we want to move down here, um, what we could do, we could uh, try to regulate the fishing pressure, and if we do, the only thing we will observe is that we will stay in the same uh, stability domain. We would need multiple management uh, approaches. We would need also to address some of the, uh, these other variables. So I guess this is another les lesson about nonlinearity. It's just um, not one, one aspect that, that is important. There are many variables uh, you need to address. So nonlinearity <coughs> um, is um, builds on, on, on also on the, on the theories about slow variables. That there are these slow variables um, that will affect the system, and when you reach a threshold you will have a rather rapid, abrupt change. And that threshold, <clears throat> going over that threshold, can be triggered by disturbances. So slow variables and disturbances are an important part of resilient thinking. And here shows, um, sort of over time, the development of uh, wildfires and floods. And they are all um, increasing uh, dramatically and resulting in, in in compounding disturbances. So these are, in fact, disturbances where one is overlaid on top of the other. Uh, this is just an example from the Canadian forest where uh, fire, oops, sorry, fire and insects <clears throat> and clear cutting are um, overlaid. And there seems to be some sort of change in the 1970s where, where the disturbance is now operating on a much, the combined level of services are operating on a much higher level. And this has led to uh, this idea and visualization of, of resilience and, and systems theory that you can have a system in the beginning which is quite resilient. You have a, sort of a deep bowl and, and the bowl is, <clears throat> the ball in the bowl is, is the system and there is a, quite a distinct threshold. That can be changed over time by these slow variables. So overfishing, uh, eutrophication, uh, accumulation of phosphorus, fire prevention would slow down or, or decrease the height of that. And then when you have a combination of disturbances uh, which you haven't had before, or even some of the disturbances that you could uh, absorb before, when they hit, you, you pass the threshold and you in move from a system uh, like a marine system dominated by coral to one dominated by algae, and there's a huge difference when it comes to uh, the economic output of these two systems. Uh, the same with clear water and turbid water, grassland and shrub bushland. There, there are lots of literature on these issues showing that this flip is actually <clears throat> uh, been, from an economic point of view, uh, a very negative development. Uh, and so there are a lot of efforts going into try to understand how we how could we move the system back. So 
Some of the main questions coming out from uh, ecologists on this is how can we assess how far from a threshold we are? Uh, if a regime shift occurs, to what extent is it reversible? And how do we design management for systems with thresholds and multiple states? And I think the last one, the last question is also really relevant in a planning issue that if we bring in um, non-linearity, multiple states, uh, how do we then change our thinking? And how do we design uh, our planning and our management and our institutions? Just a few words then um, about, given that there are hundreds of variables out there um, to be monitoring, uh, what, what should we actually care about? What should we focus on and concentrate on? And I would be quite bold and say, when it comes to ecological systems, the two variables that are important, it's diversity and modularity. These are uh, something we should care about. Diversity we should care about because we know, and it's been empirically proven, that if we increase species diversity, we also decrease the variation in productivity. <clears throat> so what this shows along this line is you have plant species richness, and then you have um, a decade-long experiment, and when you increase richness, you have less variation in, in production, even though you had, had floods and droughts and everything. So that's an important uh, lesson. Another important lesson is that uh, there's uh, one component of diversity is called response diversity, and that is actually um, characteristic of where <clears throat> several organisms uh, contribute to the same function, but they respond differently to a disturbance. So in this case, uh, you have two pollinators. One is abundant, one is rare. You have a disturbance. Uh, the abundant species will decrease, the, the less abundant will increase, and that would represent uh, a very simple example of response diversity, that you actually maintain the function. And this is perhaps the most important aspect of diversity. Uh, another important uh, variable is the modul modularity, <clears throat> uh, where um, it resulted in the hypothesis on, on uh, intermediate modularity. If the modularity is too high, which means that you have uh, bits and parts very isolated in the landscape, um, and you could be very highly connected locally, but on the other hand, uh, all these uh, patches are very isolated. You could also have low modularity. You have <clears throat> sort of a global connectivity uh, and somewhere in between the intermediate modularity. And there are numerous studies, both empirical and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, modeling studies, showing that you actually increase robustness of the system if you try to move from uh, too high modularity or too low mod modularity to some, some sort of intermediate modularity. This has been used, this thinking in a large scale way when it comes to marine fisheries. So um, what you see here is <clears throat> the fluctuation in, in populations of fish uh, <clears throat> without any harvesting. And this would be the environmental uh, fluctuation. Then we add uh, a harvesting of fish. And in the normal uh, quota-based system, there, there is a risk of a population crash, that you actually eradicate the population, at least locally. While you could design a system where you have no-take areas in that production landscape, uh, so these, there will be areas interspersed with harvest areas that are no-take areas, and they would buffer for that environmental variation. So this is one way how you can operationalize insights and resilience and modularity in designing a new production landscape that actually, as part of your production, you include no-take areas. So, some rules of thumb <clears throat> so far. Uh, assume thresholds in multiple states unless proven otherwise. I think it's time we, we get away from uh, assuming that the world is always linear, to assuming that it might be linear <laughs> in, in some occasions. Um, identify possible slow controlling variables. 
identify what is happening on the scale above and the scale below. And I think here's where, where resilience uh, <clears throat> thinking could help a lot to um, approach, give new approaches and ask new questions that they will actually explicitly introduce scales, both lower and higher scales. Maintain diversity and maintain uh, modularity. Then, how are resilience and transformation related? This, <clears throat> these two concepts um, could seems like a um, paradox, that resilience is about sort of keeping the system as it is to buffer against change, and transformation is all about change. So how do we reconcile that? And I think here's where people have been struggling, and I think particularly in the urban context, where we know that the urban landscape is con continuously changing, <clears throat> and also where there is sometimes need of, of much of transformation away from fossil fuel dependent transportation, for example, or, or other aspects. How do we then, how can we use resilience and transformation in, so that these two concepts um, <clears throat> support each other? I think one, one way of doing it is actually to um, state that there are sort of two types here. There, there's one resilience, we could call it general resilience, which denotes the resilience on a much larger scale, the regional or even global scale. And to maintain the resilience on a global scale, you would actually need, it would necessitate transformation on a local scale. And lots of those transformations. Because if you don't transform, you will continue to erode that global resilience. So I think that's one way of viewing this, that it's about scale, Transformation on, on a local and regional scale is necessary for maintaining resilience on a global scale. I also want to say that we could also think of, of uh, resilience as, as an approach to address a more local uh, scale issues, and we could label that specified resilience. But here I, I also want to caution that we have to do that in a very non-normative way. Um, and to ask resilience of what, to what, and for whom. There's an important equity aspect here as well. So, coming to urban resilience. <laughs> so, over the past years, uh, resilience has been increasingly taken up in the urban policy discourse everywhere. There are even <laughs> lots of conferences. There's a yearly conference on resilient cities and publications. And from the UN, this is the latest <clears throat> publication from the World Bank, it, just a couple of weeks old, on um, four degrees turn down the heat. And I think, and, and the word resilience occurs about <clears throat> twice on every page. But I think it's, it's in, con in this context where also urban resilience have, the, the discussion have developed on climate change and climate change adaptation. And one important aspect here is, of course, sea level rise and, and the fact that 60% of the world's population live within <coughs> 10 kilometers from a coastline. This is a major, major, major challenge. Uh, and how do we address this? And, and particularly, there are these big, really big megacities uh, that are vulnerable in this context. And there's real world evidence <coughs> of what could happen. This is a picture from New York Jersey in November after Sandy. And the discussion after in, in northeastern US on, on how to address climate change and how to also how to use the concept of resilience in that in that work uh, and developing a policy which involves a lot of important things when it comes to reducing social vulnerability, uh, looking at the institutions, but also, <clears throat> importantly, I think, bringing back nature into the long-term urban planning, that it's, in fact, now part of, of very serious plans to restore wetlands as one way of reducing your, your vulnerability uh, to <clears throat> increasing sea level. We have in Europe, of course, another climate change challenge, uh, the urban heat waves. Yeah, maybe not today, but <laughs> uh, in 2003 there was a, a serious one affecting uh, many cities and, and particularly Paris was badly hit 
with more than 70,000 excess deaths. And I think it's in this context as well, uh, resilience has been used. Um, how do we build a resilient urban landscape to, to uh, <clears throat> and reduce the effects of, of coming urban heat waves? Because we know these will be coming. <clears throat> of all the projections coming out of IPCC, this will have the highest likelihood. And so we need um, to address this. And, and in some ways it's simple. You just increase the green canopy. So this is a study showing how much you could actually reduce temperature by increasing. Uh, if you increase the canopy with 10% 10, 10 you would decrease the temperature with 3 degrees. So that's part of building resilience in the, in the urban landscape. But I think we, it's also so important we scale up, not just focusing narrowly on the urban um, landscape, the individual city, and understand that the city's connectivity, as we saw in the beginning of this talk, has changed so much from in the old days when they were a very direct um, connectivity or direct contact with the hinterland, the feedback mechanisms were also direct. If you overexploited your resources, you, you quite quickly uh, got the message back. Now we're living in a world with extremely obscure trade <coughs> networks, uh, import of, uh, of uh, food and, and other material, and export of waste. Uh, we have incredibly complex networks of interrelationships, incentives and feedbacks. And so I think it's important um, that we also try to use perhaps one, one of the, the most useful part of the resilience concept is actually that it will force us to address scale, uh, the one below we're working on and also the one uh, above the one we're working on. And this has now been highlighted by the UN. This is a study that came out uh, last year looking at <clears throat> biodiversity and ecosystems as part of this larger uh, scale. And um, the UN Secretary General made a statement, the principal message is that urban areas must offer better stewardship of the ecosystems on which they rely. So this means <clears throat> that urban areas need to be not only responsible for, for the ecosystems, the nature, the production <clears throat> within the city, but also on all other ecosystems on which they rely for food and other material. And I think this is a new signal from the UN and sort of the global governance system reaching out a hand to the local governments uh, to work together and this <clears throat> viewing as this an important part of, of sustainability. I'm just going to end to say something about urban resilience and planning. And to many of you as a surprise, I think, is that one of the earliest papers on resilience and planning was actually published by Bas Holling himself in 1971. So there is a long history that goes back from ecology and urban planning. Uh, and I think uh, <clears throat> this conference now is, is a way where we could reconnect that again in, in, in a fruitful development. So resilient thinking and planning, there, <clears throat> there was, a, a, I think, a brilliant thesis on this published by Catherine Wilkinson last year, where she, uh, in five papers, went through all the opportunities and challenges when it came to uh, using uh, re the resilience com concept in planning. Uh, so among the opportunities is that it provides a new language and metaphors for the dynamics of change in complex systems provides new tools and met methods for analysis and synthesis, confronts modes of governance based on assumptions of predictability and controllability, and addresses urban teleconnections. On the other hand, there are of course challenges <coughs> um, that resilience thinking provides little guidance in prioritizing or addressing trade-offs between different strategies, uh, draws attention to uncertainty at a time when decision makers want to feel more, not less secure, and requires significant organizational commitment. And I think the, the latter one is perhaps <clears throat> a very serious barrier that in really <clears throat> integrating resilience thinking in, in 
urban planning and policy, you need a lot of collaboration among agencies. And there has to be a lot of investment organizationally from um, in the municipality. So to summarize, <clears throat> what could then be um, taken on board and operationalized in urban resilience thinking? Uh, and I use thinking here. I don't use. Uh, I don't want to call this urban resilience theory because I don't think it's a theory yet. It's a thinking. It's a heuristic model. It's something to um, a source of inspiration to ask new questions. But I think there are some things coming out of the last 20 years or 30 years of research and resilience that are applicable to the urban landscape that when you incorporate resilience in your planning, uh, that should involve enabling high rates of innovation, maintaining diversity, maintaining modularity, restore lost ecological functions, address teleconnections, tighten feedback loops, build social capital, address equity, build overlapping governance and creating incentives for stewardship of, of distant ecosystems. And I think there are lots of interesting literature on this area coming. Uh, so just recently, a few weeks ago, there was a special issue of planning practice and research <clears throat> on uh, urban planning and resilience. And I want to recommend that whole issue to everyone that is interested. Uh, in a few months, there is a, a new book coming out from Taylor and Francis, Resilient Sustainable Cities, uh, edited by Peter Roberts, Peter Newton, Leonie Pearson. And I think <clears throat> that book promises to be uh, very exciting, uh, also bringing in uh, all the practical, uh, a discussion on all the practical challenges. And um, there's also Springer is publishing an open access ebook on urbanization, biodiversity, and ecosystem services, challenges and opportunities, which very much will address these scale issues and, and urban teleconnections and how you could address them and the consequences if you don't. And with that, I want to end and say that I, I look forward to the next few days of, of intensive discussion on the concept of resilience and the concept of sustainability. And I hope that my presentation has given a little bit of background and perhaps also some uh, things <clears throat> that would uh, stimulate further thinking. Uh, we still have a long way to go to uh, actually find a practical way of how to apply resilience in urban planning. Uh, I don't think it's uh, impossible to get there, but I think there's still a lot of hard work uh, we need to do and a lot of discussions. But I'm, I'm looking forward to that work and those uh, discussions. So thank you very much.